Alyssa Lane, I'm the director of the University Center for Human Values, and we're thrilled to be able to collaborate with the Day of Action and with our colleagues to present this uh, lab on community organizing. This is actually the second in a series of values and praxis labs that UCHV is sponsoring this semester. And so the third one, I'll just give an announcement, is going to be on April 6th. That's a Thursday at 4.30 in Marks 301 with Heather Howard talking about New Jersey politics um, and how one can get involved in community organizing um, around uh, the forthcoming gubernatorial election and other issues in state politics. Um, but for today, um, I'm really thrilled that we've been able to put this um, event together. And I want to thank um, the members of my staff, Sue Winters and Maureen Killeen, and Sebastian Philippe and his colleagues, and all the volunteers who've done so much to organize this fantastic day. Let's just thank all of the organizers. So my, no, my role now is to introduce um, my uh, dear and esteemed colleague, um, Professor Jeff, Jeffrey Stout um, and of the Department of Religion, the author of so many important works in uh, religion and political ethics, including Blessed Are the Organized, which gave us our inspiration for this session. And he's going to introduce you to the rest of the panel. Jeff Stout. Donald Trump <laughs> currently has a lot of power. Economic, persuasive, social, and governmental power. His money enables him to offer others a financial incentive to cooperate in the achievement of his ends. He has persuaded many others that it would be good for his ends to be achieved. His rallies has, have formed his followers into a group configured in a way that is consonant with his ends. By melding these forms of power, he has become the chief executive of the most powerful government on earth. Trump shows every sign that he intends to dominate others insofar as he can and to exacerbate domination based on class, gender, and race, and so far as he can. Our Constitution provided us with little protection against these forms of domination. It did, however, provide some protections against overly concentrated governmental power, and these worthy features of our Constitution now appear in grave jeopardy. The question before us this afternoon is how we might assemble or organize so as to exert counterpower against a president who aims to weaken or eliminate all remaining checks on his executive power, on the economic power of his class, and on the cultural power of his racial group. The most important thing to keep in mind, however, is that Trump's power is itself nothing but a lot of people cooperating with him toward the achievement of his end. Many current Trump supporters responded favorably to Obama's use of the rhetoric of grassroots democracy in 2008. By June of that year, he had already turned his future administration over to Geithner, Summers, Clinton, and Gates. Trump and Sanders competed for the voters Obama had left in the lurch. No democratic organizational effort will succeed going forward unless the legitimate reasons people have for despising neoliberal elites are understood. This is a very hard message for a Princeton audience to absorb. Candidate Obama's talk of grassroots democracy swept him into power because there is, was truth in it. It is true that a defining power struggle of our time is between ordinary people and a dominant economic elite. But having someone like him in the White House without having an extensively organized grassroots base outside the political parties 
to hold him and his party accountable was bound to leave the basic power struggle unresolved. Obama used his grassroots democratic rhetoric deceptively, but whoever thought that his own campaign apparatus could hold him accountable was foolish. Obama's policies on all of the crucial topics of his presidency came from the top down. They resulted from compromises worked out among the president's advisors, key players in Congress, generals, and corporate executives. David Pluff was called on to mobilize something called grassroots support for a policy, only when the parameters of negotiation among ruling elites had become relatively clear and Obama sought to strengthen his hand during the weeks immediately preceding a major decision. A progressive power base has to be independent of the political parties if it is going to hold ruling elites accountable and counter their domination of ordinary people. Occupy Wall Street was able to draw attention to the issue of economic domination, but wasn't able to hold itself together generate much power, or explain how economic domination can be overcome. We need to ask why. In the Egyptian Arab Spring, a loose coalition of demonstrators generated enough power to bring down a dictator. When the election came, the Muslim Brotherhood took power at the expense of other demonstrators who had gathered in Tahrir Square. Why was that? The Brotherhood had spent the previous six decades organizing on a face-to-face -face basis. It had organizational strength without commitment to democracy. The secular urbanites had vaguely democratic hopes without organizational strength. The Egyptian military was therefore able to exploit the resulting rift and return to power. We need to learn from these examples. But our purpose this afternoon is to, dis is to discuss some more hopeful ones. Abolitionism, feminism, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, Swaraj, the anti-apartheid struggle are examples of grassroots movements that develop the organizational density and breadth of the Muslim Brotherhood while espousing a democratic end and maintaining a mostly democratic internal structure. By a democratic end, I mean opposition to a particular form of domination or arbitrary exclusion. Democratic movements tend to take on one form of domination, some one. They organize around a small cluster of issues. By a democratic internal structure, I mean a distribution of powers and responsibilities within the group that permits rank and file members to influence and contest the group's decisions and to hold group leaders accountable as agents of the group. A central question of contemporary grassroots activism is what an acceptable distribution of powers and responsibilities within a group struggling for justice and equality looks like. Not all grassroots organizing is movement organizing. Community organizing and faith-based organizing attempt to build lasting local coalitions of religious and civic institutions that are capable of taking up multiple concerns over time. Since 1970 or so, a tradition uh, now known as broad-based organizing has attempted to overcome the tendency of earlier community organizations to degenerate either into anti-democratic groups or into groups that just disintegrate. As the name suggests, broad-based organizing tends to broaden the base of organizing to include multiple communities from the outset. By subjecting internal practices of accountability and organizing to constant self-criticism, many local citizens' organizations have now succeeded in surviving for decades in recognizably democratic form and in achieving considerable uh, successes, though most of those successes and the practices of those groups are almost entirely below the radar uh, 
thereby causing a hope deficit on the part of people who care about justice. Let me now introduce the panelists I have invited to speak about the varieties and challenges of organizing today. Daniel May is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Religion. He has served as an organizer for ACORN, the Industrial Areas Foundation, and J Street. Niall Fort is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Religion. He is associated with the Movement for Black Lives and is a founder of Newark Books and Breakfast. Jessica Sariot is an MPA candidate in the Woodrow Wilson School. She has worked as a community organizer in Virginia and for the Mennonite Central Committee. And finally, we have Cornell West, a friend and comrade with whom I have been discussing these matters and collaborating in activism for four decades. Hey everyone, I'm Jessica Sario. As um, Professor Stout said, I'm in the Woodrow Wilson School here. Um, and I'm here to share one story um, from my years in community organizing as hopefully an illustration of the kinds of things that can be done. Um, but before that, I want to say a little bit about why I got into organizing. Um, I got to the age of 24 and I was very angry at a series of things. Um, I had grown up living internationally for most of my life, um, moving around a lot, and it had given me the opportunity, uh, the strange privilege to be witness to a lot of other people's oppression. Um, and so by 24, I was angry that I'd spent two years in Colombia and that the network of peace churches that I worked with hadn't been able to dismantle the gang structure and the gang power in their neighborhoods. I was angry that I'd spent three years in undergrad organizing around boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and that despite that effort, my university hadn't divested from the Israeli occupation. I was angry that I'd spent summers protesting and getting tear gas along with many others, and that the wall in Israel um, that was separating the West Bank from itself in many areas um, not only was not taken down, but was continuing to expand. Um, and I was frustrated. Um, and so my entry into organizing in a lot of ways um, was a lesson to me in, in accepting to take winnable, concrete action on issues um, that we actually had power to leverage around. Um, and so my story is, is a humble one, I feel like, in a day and age where I'm looking at Steve Bannon and I'm wondering again at these larger structures. Um, but, but to me, it's a testament also of the power of local organizing. So for two and a half years, I was with Virginians Organized for Interfaith Community Engagement, which is one um, affiliate of the Industrial Areas Foundation. Uh, they have about 45 members that are churches, mosques, synagogues, institutions of faith. They've taken on a broad range of issues. Um, I was specifically located in Arlington, Virginia, uh, which is one of the zip, uh, includes some of the wealthiest zip codes in the United States. So coming from a relatively poor area in Columbia before that, it seemed strange to me to be organizing in this space. Um, but if you get to know a place well, you usually find what's underneath it. Um, and Arlington has a problem with gentrification. Arlington has a huge problem uh, with affordable housing and with pushing out its brown and black members. Uh, there's three distinct black communities that have been there since basically the end of slavery, and there's a uh, burgeoning immigrant population since the 80s um, that are fighting to stay in an area where their kids have good opportunities in public schools. Um, and so one of the most important moments to me in my two years organizing was standing in the Arlington County boardroom um, and watching as the county board members, five of them, had to respond politically uh, to the demands and to the testimonies of um, women that I had spoken to, women that had been scared to share their testimony, um, women that didn't think that they had power, and then when they came together, they were able to change the course of, um, of their community's future. Um, so briefly, without getting into too much detail, since Arlington politics is probably not the order du jour, um, there is a long-standing uh, process to pass an affordable housing master plan, which would guarantee 18% of the county be set aside uh, for committed affordable housing. Um, and this has been a, a plan in the making, um, which Voice, as an institution, had been tracking and had been engaging with the county board members around. In the 11th hour, about a month before it was supposed to be voted on, um, a group called the Coalition of Arlingtonians for um, Responsible Development uh, came out saying that they 
were against, or rather they called for a moratorium on any additional affordable housing in areas of the county that had a larger than average amount of free and reduced lunch kids. Um, basically, that along the southern part of Arlington, which is Columbia Pike our, um, area, many of the schools there are already very high uh, minority children. Um, and that is the area that most needs to preserve affordable housing because that by and large is where folks uh, are living that, that need that kind of need that kind of housing assistance. And so what this group all of a sudden said was, fine, fine, affordable housing, just not here, right? Which is the typical thing. Um, but here it's important to look at power because this was a group of single family homeowners that were working through a civic association that did not communicate in Spanish, that did not communicate to renters, and that presumed to speak on behalf of their entire community. Um, and so what we did as Voice was we got Reverend Tara McCabe, who was a Presbyterian pastor, we got uh, the PTA president, we got Claudia Del Grillo, who was one of the teachers in uh, Barcroft Elementary School, and we got the folks that we already had established relationships with on other campaigns or because we were doing one-on-ones or community listening sessions together, and we said, okay, this is the situation, what do we want to do? Pulled together 50 plus parents, teachers along Columbia Pike Corridor, and they said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to call ourselves Mi Voz Cuenta, my voice counts, we're going to draft our own letter, we're going to get 400 signatures and blow their letter out of the water, and we're going to show up the day of the county board meeting, and we're going to share our stories. Um, and so I remember preparing with Carolina Perez, who was an affordable housing tenant um, and a mother, and she gave the most amazing testimony of basically saying, how dare you my, say that my daughter is lowering the quality of education for your child. My daughter works incredibly hard. This is what she's gone through. These are her test scores. This is what is important for our community. And we need this affordable housing if we're going to be able to stay. Um, and, and many other testimonies that day. And when the county board members finally voted yes, that they would pass the affordable housing master plan, they cited Carolina Perez. They cited Mi Voz Cuenta. And they gave recognition to the folks that had really turned up. Um, and a week later, I was debriefing with Carolina, and she said to me, you know, I was really, really nervous, and part of that was that I'm from El Salvador, and when I was a child, I remember hearing my parents say that the bodies in the streets outside were because people had spoken out politically, and that it was dangerous, and you didn't do that. Um, and now I feel like I can do that, and now I sort of see a way how I can have more power in this community. And to me, that is important, um, the teaching of how to be effective in the public sphere is incredibly important. Also, the fact that however Mi Voz Cuenta gels, however those individual leaders continue to engage, there is an institutional uh, memory and there is uh, a team of local leaders from the institutions that are members of the larger coalition that are able to check in and not just pass one resolution and then move on, but pass it and then continue to be there in the offices of the county board members uh, the following weeks, the following months to make sure that it's implemented. Um, so if I want to conclude with a few uh, questions that I have, because one of the things that we talked about was not just sharing sort of where, where we've organized and how that's looked, but also some of the questions that we're wrestling today. Um, there's a reason I'm not still organizing right now and that I'm doing this master's, and a large part of that is a very real question that I had, um, which is how, how to translate this community accountability process um, in, in, for, my, for my history in contexts where there's a lot of conflict and where there's a lot of violent repression. Um, so we have been extremely lucky in this country uh, on a lot of fronts that a lot of times apathy has been our largest enemy um, as opposed to actual violent repression. Um, and I'm concerned that, that, that if we don't take advantage of that liberty, it erodes. Um, and so that's something that I've been wrestling with. I've also been wrestling with what it means to be white and to be Western um, in a context where a lot of the issues we need to be organizing around have to do with making sure there's enough power um, in the black and brown community and that we are dismantling white supremacy and that we're working against these larger systems. And, and so that is a continued challenge. Um, but I'll leave it at that for now and let my colleagues continue. I'm sure we'll have some Q&A later. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, Jessica and Professor Stout. Uh, it's great to be with you all, with friends and teachers. Um, so organizing is the work of building power. 
Now this is, when I first heard it, a rather uh, disconcerting notion. It, uh, made me a little uncomfortable, the first organizer who told me that organizing was about power, because I didn't get into politics at the time for power. I grew up in a, a family in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was a Jewish day school kid, um, but I was taught in my sort of within the walls of my family that the number, that the, the first commandment was to vote Democrat. And that was the, that gives you a sense of the kind of uh, family I grew up in. So I got into politics, right, because I wanted to make a difference and I cared about justice uh, and equality. Uh, and these you know, principles that I was taught around the Seder table were what made life um, worth living. So I got a job after college for the senator from my home state, a guy named Paul Wellstone, uh, who died tragically in a plane crash. And I was like obsessed with Paul. Everyone called him Paul. Right? He was like this great role model. Uh, and I was so thrilled to go to DC to work for him. But at the time, I was living with a group of teachers who were first year teachers in Washington, DC, just a couple blocks from the Capitol. And I'd come home from the Hill, and they'd come home from their classrooms late in the evening because they were running an after school program, but kids wouldn't stay after school for the after school program unless the teachers walked them home because they were scared of violence in their neighborhood. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill that summer, we were debating the estate tax and whether the estate tax should be capped at five million or one million. And Paul Wellstone used to say, this is the debate in our, in our capital, right, between families who make more than five million and families who make more than one million. And I would rant to the senator, because that's the sort of thing I did back then and just back then. Uh, you know, how do we get those issues that matter to those families to matter here in the Hill? And he said, well, you still think that we're the folks who make a change. But politicians react. And if you want to change American politics, you got to build something that forces us to react. That made some sense to me. I heard about this weird thing called organizing randomly from a friend of mine from college who had spent the summer with an organization called ACORN, now nefarious ACORN. Uh, I left DC, I got a job going door to door doing block club organizing in New York in the South Bronx in the poorest congressional district in America, which I did for about two years. Those years didn't actually teach me how to be an organizer, but they taught me that I wanted to learn how to be an organizer because for the first time, I got close to people who were really catching hell for the only reason that they were poor. And they became people that mattered a great deal to me. They became people whose couches I spent night after night sleeping on because it was you know, easier than commuting. I was working 14 hours a day anyway. And when Harlem Hospital botched a surgery for one of those women, Vivian Bozier, it was somebody that I really cared about, somebody that mattered a lot to me. And I wanted to figure out how could we build an organization that allowed those folks to hit back. And I realized that I wasn't learning that um, with the organization I was with. And I was doing all this reading around organizing and learned about this guy named Saul Alinsky and the organization he founded called the Industrial Areas Foundation, where Jessica also worked. And I moved to Los Angeles to work with a particular organizer named Ernesto Cortez. And it was in LA that I began to develop some of the practices that I now think about as sort of central to organizing. So I was sent to Southeast Los Angeles. Any LA people here? A couple, all right. So my turf was Southeast LA. Huntington Park, Cudahy, Maywood, Southgate, Compton, those cities that some of you have heard about from, I don't know, music and you know, <laughs> movies. Um, so those, those neighborhoods now are predominantly undocumented immigrants. And the work that I had as an organizer was initially just to go and talk to as many people as possible. So I was working primarily with, with churches, and so I would go and talk to the priest, and then he'd go and tell me to talk to people that he didn't think were ever gonna talk, tell him to do anything so that I would leave him alone. Uh, and over time, I just met with dozens and dozens of people over um, really six months before we even had any semblance of an organization. And to briefly tell a story that um, Professor Stout tells in, uh, in his book on organizing, one of the stories that I quickly heard in the areas that I was working in was from folks who told me that they would never go to, they'd, they'd be describing the activities they were involved in in their congregations. And they'd say, you know, but I don't ever go to church on Thursday and Friday because that's when we have checkpoints here uh, in the Southeast. I was like, what do you mean checkpoints? Well, from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. down Slauson Boulevard, the main boulevard in Maywood, California, the police every, every Thursday and Friday would stop every car that went through and just ask for a driver's license. Not a breathalyzer, just a driver's license. Any sense of why they would do that? Anyone? Why would, why would police just be checking driver's licenses in 2006? What? 
There you go, exactly, looking for undocumented immigrants, right? And there was a state law that if you're, you were driving without a license, your car was automatically impounded for 30 days. $30 a day in the impound, $900 total, $250 fines to the city, $1,200 to get your car out. Every week, the tow yard was auctioning hundreds and hundreds of cars because people couldn't pay $1,300 to get a car out, right? We're talking about undocumented people. We're talking about people who are, you know, low-income folks. So we decided, all right, this is going to be the first issue. We're going to test whether we can organize uh, and, and build something that could do something about this. So we start doing a little bit of research. We go meet with the chief of police, uh, and he says, I don't know if this is really an issue here. I mean, people come and talk to me. If this was something people cared about, they would have come and talked to me about it, right? Uh, as if undocumented folks were going to come to the chief of police and tell them that <laughs> this was really a concern of theirs. Uh, so we pulled initially uh, the, um, we had a little team of folks at this church, St. Rosa Lima. We pulled the, um, the data from the election. Uh, well, first we pulled the budgets, trying to figure out where the money was going. Turned out not a whole lot of money was going to the city from these impounds. So where was it going? Any guesses? What? Tow yard, Maywood Club Towing was where hundreds of thousands of dollars were going every month. It's my first lesson about power. So power, you learn quickly as an organizer, comes in two forms, organized money and organized people. Classic example of organized money is, you know, what I thought was a really, you know, rinky-dink organization, Maywood Club Towing. We then pulled the election uh, candidate contributions and found out that it was employees of the tow yard that were paying for all the city council members' campaigns. Tiny little city, nobody running against the city council members, doesn't cost a lot to get into city council. You know, $20,000, $30,000 is enough to run your campaign. So, we decide we're going to plan this big assembly. We, you know, get in the, in the, play, in the, the parking lot of the church, 1,500 folks, get the mayor of the city, um, get the owner of the tow yard comes, and one of the members of the congregation, we, we have several people tell stories, these are undocumented people telling stories about how it destroyed their lives, having their cars taken away and what it did for their livelihood, and this uh, guy, Jose Miranda, who was a, a, a DJ actually on Latino radio, says to the mayor, you know, usted está allí porque nosotros votamos por ahí, you know, you're there because we voted for you. Uh, and will you agree to, to a moratorium on the, on the impounds? And what does the mayor say? In front of 1,500 people? He says, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. It's so great to see all, the, all these folks involved in our community. We've never seen anything like this in Maywood. Next day, tow yard, um, uh, more, you know, no, no, uh, no checkpoints. Next week, no checkpoints. We think this is like this amazing victory, right? We have this like incredible achievement. Everybody in the church is so excited. You know, Danny, what are we gonna do next? We gotta get new homes built. We gotta get new schools built. Then we start getting phone calls at the church that there are stakeouts happening at various different, basically, sweatshops around the area, where police are just showing up at 6, 7 a.m. when they know folks are coming to work and pulling people over for a cracked taillight or something hanging in the mirror, and the impounds begin, or the, the impounds begin again, right? And it becomes a story in the church that every, every police officer is like a, a roving checkpoint. Right? But the actual numbers quickly get up to what they were. Folks in the community are getting extremely discouraged. Right? We have this like, terrible meeting of 20 of the top leaders. You know, folks are saying to me, like, you said that this was going to work. You, know, what, what, you told us we were going to win. And now we're in the same position again, right? two years later. We had you know, key leaders, Jose, who had you know, done this great action with the mayor, storms out of the room. He says he doesn't want to be involved anymore. So we decide that we're going to develop a strategy. Oh, the other key piece is that the, the, the city council decides that they're not going to meet with us anymore. So they just stop re returning any phone calls. They just completely block us out of any meetings. So we decide that we're going to try to put together a strategy around voting out the city council. But the challenge, of course, is that we have a congregation of several thousand people. You know, we can move 1,500, 2,000 people at this point, but most are not folks who can vote. So how are we going to get the city council out of office if our entire base is undocumented immigrants? So we developed this plan that we're going to have one, every person who's part of our team is going to identify 10 voters on their block. You know, we figure, okay, over six months, we get 1,000 people to do that, we'll be able to move 10,000 votes, we'll get a new city council uh, into office. To make a long story short, that's what we do. Do a big meeting the night before the election, church is full of folks, you know, people are like, there's no room to sit. Uh, the next day, a new city council is elected 
uh, into office, the first motion of the new city council is to disband the police, uh, the, the traffic division of the police department. They invite in the attorney general at the time to do an investigation of the police department, which ends up uncovering all this stuff that I thought was just like crazy conspiratorial rumors. Turns out the owner of the tow yard was offering kickbacks to the police officers that got the most number of cars impounded. So you got a trip to Vegas, you got prostitutes and you know piles of cocaine. This is actually in the Attorney General's report about the Maywood Police Department. The police department ends up not being able to get insurance for based on this report and they end up having to close down the Maywood Police Department, which no longer exists as a result of that work. Okay, so obviously I learned a huge amount through that experience, right? I learned a lot about the practices of organizing. The mo two most important things that I learned were the centrality of relationships and the way in which the relationships that we built from the beginning, there's no way that we would have been able to sustain the loss that really we incurred after what we thought was the first victory had it not been for two years of systematically building the relationships. And those relationships were built around self-interest and that's the, the other really important point that I learned. But I think we often think that self-interest is a sort of material concept. It's just about what you want. But it turned out that the leaders of that campaign were not people who had their cars taken away. They were people who had a memory and an experience and a history of the kind of situation that people who had their cars taken away were in. So Marcos Hernandez, who became one of the key uh, leaders in that campaign, he was a teacher at the time, he's now a principal. He's not undocumented, but he came over the border at the age of six in the trunk of his father's car. Right? Those were the people who became the central leaders and their self-interest was about a commitment to themselves and to the people that they were close to. So the IF teaches that self-interest is about the idea of interest as rooted in interesse, the Greek concept of in-between. So who are the people that you're among and, and between? And what that meant for me was that I had to learn how to talk about my own self-interest. Who are the people that I am among and between? Who are the stories, what are the stories that are most important to me? Right, which I could spend a lot of time talking about, but I realized that I wasn't going to build anything unless I was able to show some vulnerability around myself, around the people and the experiences that were most important to me. So we'll talk more about um, some of this uh, and some of these concepts. I think just to, to wrap up, I mean, if those are some of the things that I learned, I also learned an important lesson about the limitations of the kind of organizing that I was engaged in, which is part of what has led me to be here with all of you at Princeton. because. As soon as we tried to figure out how to move beyond the local situation of Maywood, try to change the state law, try to begin to deal with the reality of driver's licenses for immigrants, we quickly ran up against very significant obstacles that we did not have a method of, of, uh, of, of challenging, right? We could not figure out how did we go, how could we go from this really close knit, you know, organization that could move 5,000 people in a small community to something that would actually have state power or potentially national power. So the big challenge that I think, and this is acute right now, right? The whole model of organizing in the Alinsky tradition comes out of labor unions. Alinsky was taught by John Lewis. It's an accountability politics based on a redistribution of resources, hugely important. But what happens, how do you, how does that, how do those kind of practices, how can they deal with challenges when, we, when we're dealing with, you know, the kind of systemic disenfranchisement we're dealing with, when we're dealing with the kind of influence and money and politics that we're dealing with, when we're dealing with the crisis of legitimacy uh, that we're dealing with, when, we're, when we're, t we're talking about the kind of neoliberal policies that have created such massive inequality. Uh, and to me the question is how do, how do the practices of organizing that I think are so important around relationships and stories and self-interest, how can those practices be used as a springboard for building the kind of power that we need for the challenges that we face in our current crisis? So thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm honored to be here and be here with you all. So I come out of the black church tradition. We have like a call and response tradition. I'm also super nervous. Um, so I'm going to need y'all to just help me out a little bit. So there's a chant that uh, means a lot to me. Um, that's like something that we always did in my organizing experience uh, in Newark and also in Ferguson, which I'll talk to you about in a second. But before I get into it, I just want us to practice that chant. Is that cool? So I'm going to start, and you're going to have to respond. So I'm going to say, if we don't get it, you say, shut it down. All right? Y'all ready? Ready. 
If we don't get it, if we don't get it, if we don't get it, if Michael Brown don't get it, if Rihanna Stanley Jones don't get it, if we don't get it, if Tamir Rice don't get it, if we don't get it, all right, thank y'all so much. <laughs> A quick little story before I go into the other story I want to tell. So I was uh, in New York City actually protesting for Eric Garner, and this was in the midst of applying to actually this program. Um, and I should have probably been working on my personal statement, but I was mad as hell by all the black people and other brown people and poor people who were being killed by police. So I found myself in the streets of New York City. It was raining like crazy. And I was in the middle of the biggest Apple store in the nation, and we were doing what we just chanted. We were shutting it down. And so we shut down the biggest Apple, Apple store in the nation. And I remember in the middle of the chant, one of the employees who like, seemed really, really sincere was like, what is it? <laughs> so maybe we can get around to some of that when we uh, open up for Q&A. So I graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary right across the street um, on May 26, 2014. Um, on August 9th, 2014, 18-year-old teenager Michael Brown was shot and killed by white police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. I had already had some organizing experience, but it was really like impromptu. Um, and so when Michael Brown was killed by Darren Wilson, I hopped on a bus from New York City with a group of other activists, some of whom had a lot of talents and skills and experiences, some of whom had none. Some of them were like me, had a little bit, but really didn't know what we were doing. So I headed to Ferguson, Missouri from New York, and it was in Ferguson that I really learned a lot of what to do and not to do um, in organizing. And as the chant suggests, we were shutting everything down in Ferguson. Um, I'm talking about streets, I'm talking about malls, I'm talking about, I mean, we went to the St. Louis Rams game and tried to shut that down. Um, we were young, we were mad, we were frustrated, and we had a lot of energy. And so a lot of the politics just grew out of this sense of rage, this sense of not really knowing what else to do with our bodies but to assemble out in the streets and begin to uh, just articulate our pain, articulate what we were feeling. And it was from a very visceral place that we began to forge some of our conceptions of politics, our conceptions of democracy. And there's another chant that this is what democracy looks like. There we go. <laughs> Call and response right there. So in the midst of all this shutting it down, shutting it down, shutting it down, which was extremely fun, by the way, uh, especially when you're really mad, you know, it's, it's great to see certain people who just don't think about these things a little frustrated when you're frustrated too, right? In the middle of all this shutting it down, um, we begin to ask ourselves a question, okay, we're shutting stuff down, but what do we want to build up? What do we want to build up? So remember that question, what's the it? What's the it? So there was a group of young people in Ferguson who wanted to do more than just protests out in the streets. We affirmed that, we were there at the protest, but we realized that we had to begin to ask the question of what do we actually want. So a group of people, some of whom I call friends now, created a group called Books and Breakfast. And Books and Breakfast was really out of the tradition of the Black Panther Party, who had, if you know, a 10-point program, one of which was a free breakfast for children program. I um, mean, it really emerged out of the idea that you know, children shouldn't go to school hungry. How can you learn if you're hungry? And you can feed them and also teach them socialism at the same time. Um, and so this group of young folks out of Ferguson said, hey, we have young people in our community, not, of all, not all of whom are getting killed by police, but they're going to school hungry. But they don't have a book to read. They don't own their own book. They don't have a concept of having their own library, right? Expanding their imagination. I really liked this idea because I knew I was in this for the long haul. You know, I knew I was in this for the long haul. And so I said, I want to be a part of this thing, not just to shut things down, but to build it up. So I went to the first Books and Breakfast in Ferguson, Missouri, it's October uh, 28th, I believe, in 2014. And I just loved it. Because amidst all the rage, amidst all the frustration, amidst all the tears, all that stuff we were feeling in our body, on a Saturday morning, a group of people from the community, single mothers, children, people who didn't necessarily have the time to go to a protest because they worked two jobs and they had to feed their kids, were able to come into a space that activists and organizers and freedom fighters created so that we can not just shut stuff down, but build beloved community, to use King's term. And I loved it so much. There was something about it that felt whole in a moment where so many of us felt so broken. 
And so, mind you, I'm from Newark, New Jersey, and I'm in Ferguson, and I'm trying to figure out how to organize, how to, uh, what does justice mean, how to transform society. And I said, I want to bring this back to Newark. So I went back home to Newark. Um, I just hit up like a bunch of my friends, some of whom had organizing experience and activist experience, some of whom I just knew always asked me every time something happened, hey, how can I get involved? Or hey, what can I do? So I hit up a group of my friends and we organized uh, which, what essentially became the first city to stand alongside Ferguson in what has become a national books and breakfast program, again in the tradition of the Black Panther Party. We didn't have much. Uh, we didn't have any money. We had very little resources. We didn't even have a lot of skill sets per se, um, but we just had a lot of passion. And again, we realized that there wasn't national news in Newark. There wasn't a young person who had been killed by a police officer, but there was a lot of young people who were jobless. There were a lot of young people who were in jail and a whole lot of young people who were poor. And we realized that those issues, although they're not spectacular issues that will be covered by MSNBC and CNN and Fox, that those issues are the things that affect people in our community every single day. And so we have to respond to those things. And so we created Newark Books and Breakfast. And I had built a relationship with the last and only black owned bookstore in Newark called Source of Knowledge. And it's, we can, I'm not gonna go too far into it, but one thing I wanna highlight is how do you organize through contradictions, right? So Source of Knowledge is the last and only black owned bookstore in Newark. I love that place. I grew up in that place. My mama used to take me there when I was little and I used to see the Afrocentric art and I would read books of you know, my history. Um, at the same time, the store, which I love, can also be pr quite queer phobic, can also be quite patriarchal. And we have these arguments. I have these arguments with these folks that I love who own the bookstore. And so it was a question around, do we use this space to do our books and breakfast? On the one hand, it's the last and only black owned bookstore. They're gentrifying Newark. They're trying to take away the last and only black owned bookstore that means so much to my community. And at the same time, Black Lives Matter is all about intersectional justice. It's not just about the black boys, it's about the black girls. It's not just about straight folks, it's about queer folks. So how do we do this? And so that's not something I have a resolution for you all, but it's something that we've had to organize and struggle around to figure out how do we organize um, through contradictions. So I just wanna do three things that I learned really quick and three questions that I'm wrestling with. First thing that I learned is organize where you find yourself. So yes, I got on a bus and went to Ferguson, but I didn't have to go to Ferguson to do what I did, to learn what I learned. Right in my community of Newark, there were so many young people and so many uh, issues that needed to be addressed. And it's the same thing here in Princeton. You can go right down Witherspoon, right down Nassau, or you can stay right here on this campus and realize that there's so much, um, so much to organize around. The other thing that I learned is when you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. Um, that's not directly from this story, but I was so ambitious and still am in many ways and wanted to do everything. Wanted to figure out how to bring justice into the world right now at this moment. And so I was involved in so many different things and it became a point where I realized that by doing that, I actually wasn't able to do anything well. And so one thing I have to like, wrestle with now and reflecting on that is yes, I wanna change prisons. Yes, I wanna change jobs. Yes, I don't want to, but I have to pick particular things to struggle alongside and make sure those things that are standing alongside other people are fighting in particular areas. Um, the third thing I learned was you can't make it without joy. Um, I know that's not something that we oftentimes talk about in organizing circles, but there was times where I didn't know if I wanted to continue to do this work. Um, it got very difficult, non-indictment after non-indictment after non-indictment. Organizing, sitting in four or five, six hour meetings, conference calls every other night, trying to hand in papers while doing this organizing work and you get tired. You, you, you know, despair is constantly knocking at your door, but it was the music it was, the, it was the, you know, the friends that would hit me up. It was the day-to-day the -day stuff that you know, didn't really have anything to do with politics per se. It wasn't reducible to politics. That joy that was able to sustain me. And really quickly, three questions I'm wrestling with is how do we not rely on tragedy uh, as an impetus to organize? So waiting for the next hashtag, waiting for the next hashtag. How do we organize not in response to tragedy, but thinking about organizing as a mode of being, as a way of being, as a lifestyle? Um, the second thing is how do we forge critical solidarity? So solidarity that doesn't necessitate sameness, that we don't have to be exactly the same. How do we move through identity politics, which is important but is also limited? So I got started in this work because I'm black, but I don't stay in this work because I'm black. 
not the only reason why I do this work. Um, and the last thing is, how do we transform ourselves as we transform society? You know, I grew up, I probably got my politics first and foremost from my mama, you know, who says stuff like, you know, don't be a hypocrite. There's a lot of people who say they're fighting for freedom, but they're mean-spirited and they're nasty. And a lot of organizations and campaigns, if we really look into the history, come from certain personal battles that people weren't able to get around, egos and things like that. So how do we not just transform society, but how do we transform ourselves as we seek to transform society? Thank you so much. blessing and honor to be here. I'm not going to take too much time. I'm much more interested in learning and listening from you. I want to salute my brothers and sisters here on the panel, and I especially want to salute those who had the vision and determination to have this day of action. Let's give it up for those folks. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Seems to me any time you talk about organizing, you're really talking about what kind of human being does the organizing, which means you have to begin on a very personal note. What kind of human being do you really want to be? What kind of visions, what kind of virtues, what kind of values do you want to enact before the worms get your body? It's a short trek from mama's womb to tomb. It happens very quickly. I know undergrads here at Princeton may think it's going to be forever, but it's coming at you very, very soon. And Brother Jeff and I, he's right, for 45 years we've been wrestling with the question, that Socratic legacy of Athens, arate, what kind of excellency, paideia, that deep education that shapes the soul, that formation of attention from the superficial to the substantial things in life, and that parhesia, do we have the courage to engage in the fearless speech, the unintimidated speech, the plain speech, the frank speech required to pierce through all of the mendacity that is so ubiquitous and hegemonic in our time. It seems to me I do want to begin at the very top, not because localism is not important. I think our fundamental focus must be localists across the board. But we're living, of course, in a very terrifying moment. And we have to be very honest and, 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 and candid about that. It's very important that we don't see Brother Trump as some kind of moral monster that's isolated from the history of this nation. He's a product of the American empire. He's a product of American culture. He's a product of American civilization. That I think he is a gangster in character and a neo-fascist in content. And by gangster, what I mean is not some subjective expression. I think it's an objective condition that one is a gangster if, in fact, one lives a life of callousness and indifference toward the vulnerable. One says things and does things with impunity, and one is preoccupied with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> That's gangster. And I grew up with gangster. And, and as a Christian, I was a gangster before I met Jesus. I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> but it's very important when you have somebody like that in the White House. When there's a Steve Bannon and a Steve Miller and others who are reading neo-fascists, the Julian Evolas who call themselves super fascists, you see, losing sight of the humanity of brown people's Mexicans, and Muslims, and Jews, and black folk, and women. And you say you're going to go to Iraq and take their oil, that's gangster. You're going to grab the private parts of a woman, that's gangster. And I believe in loving Christian hatred, which is loving the sinner but hating the sin. That's difficult. But I come out of the same black church tradition, brother, now. The same one Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer come out of, you see. Which is to say, when you really love folk, you hate the fact they're being treated unjustly. You loathe the fact they're being treated unfairly. And if you don't do something, the rocks are going to cry out. That's what pushes one into in organizing. I think what is fascinating about this Trump moment, this neo-fascist moment in the making, is we are seeing the best of fellow human beings, fellow citizens in the United States. That's what the Women's March was about. That's what the airport presences was about. That's what the various attempts of 
fellow citizens to become awakened and occupy and movement for black lives and the struggles against homophobia and struggles against anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Palestinian hatred, anti-Muslim hatred, anti-Mexican hatred, anti-black hatred. It brings out the best of the country. The problem simply is we're not winning. That's why organizing is important, but there has to be a certain character for those who go into the organizing and it cannot be in any way anti-intellectual ideas matter, visions matter, analysis matter. That's why when I call my dear brother Trump a neo-fascist, I'm saying I've got to give a definition of what I mean. A society run by big money with big banks and big corporations, 1% of the population having 42% of the wealth. I'm talking about the ways in which you engage in social problems in which you scapegoat the most vulnerable rather than confront the most powerful. You reinforce the worst in each and every one of us. The xenophobia, the white supremacy, the male supremacy, the anti-Arab and anti-Jewish and anti-Palestinian sensibilities inside of us as human beings, as, as Americans. That's what Brother Trump has been able to do. And he still couldn't do it enough to win the popular vote, but he did it enough to win the election. And we've got a lot of fellow citizens who are in deep pain, agony and anguish, who can't see a way out. And that choice between a neoliberal disaster, Sister Hillary, and the neo-fascist catastrophe, Brother Donald, meant they had to choose. Some of them were racist and xenophobic, some of them in deep pain and feeling as if, well, if I can't go with Brother Bernie, that's really what should have happened, but we won't go there right now. <laughs> if I can't go with Brother Bernie, then I'm, I'm going to go against the establishment. And of course, Donald Trump presents himself as anti-establishment because, in fact, neo-fascism is against the establishment of neoliberalism and neoconservatism. So he appears as rebel. He appears as radical. He appears as somebody who's going to, in the language of Stephen Bannon, deconstruct the administrative state. And of course, Jacques Derrida turns over in his grave, but we won't get into that right now. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is do the kind of things we're doing right now. Have candid conversations about the forms of democratic paideia. What are the forms of education that could lead toward the kind of transforming of our souls such that we have enough sensitivity and empathy and sympathy toward the vulnerable, whoever they are. It's got to be profoundly universalistic, even though it's rooted where we are. That we're in a world now where we've got to be internationalists. We've got to be cosmopolitan. So the drone strikes and the death of a baby in Yemen means exactly the same thing as a ba the death of a precious baby in Newtown, Connecticut, or a brown baby in East Los Angeles, or a black baby in Newark, or an Asian baby in Minnesota. That's what it is to be forever in the process of becoming a democratic organizer. And so much hangs on that adjective democratic. Someone who is fundamentally committed to the quality of life of the demos, those sly stone call everyday people, or those James Cleveland call ordinary people. In the way, of course, they've been getting crushed. The losers in corporate globalization, the losers in neoliberal politics, the losers of a Wall Street dominated government, the losers of a national security state, the losers of a national surveillance state, all of those things in the making handed to Donald Trump by my dear brother, Barack Obama. Wall Street friendly, drone strikes, expansion of national security state, increase of national surveillance. Now we've got a genuine neo-fascist in the making who has those at his disposal. And we're not even talking about his psychological profile. We won't even go there, though I love that magnificent sign that one of the sisters had next to me when I was marching, which said, in your guts, you know he's nuts. <laughs> now, that's not a social analysis. I don't want to, that's not a social analysis. We're not isolating him as an individual. He's part of larger social forces behind him, but he is, in fact, an individual who has his hand on the nuclear button. He is an individual who can put forward executive orders and have a tremendous amount of power. So, Part of what is required now is precisely what's taking place. A massive spiritual, moral, political awakening around public interest, public service, but a conception of public interest and public service that is connected to 
people in every corner of the globe because we are an empire, not just a fragile experiment in democracy and we're losing much of that democracy. We're not just white supremacists. There's no such thing as white supremacy without resistance to white supremacy, including vanilla brothers and sisters. John Brown was vanilla. Ann Braden was vanilla. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was vanilla. We're quasi vanilla. Because <laughs> our Jewish brothers and sisters are not white or goyim, but they still went in the front of the Jim Crow bus. So we got to deal with that complication. But the important thing is, any human being can choose to be a person of integrity, honesty, decency, courage, and choose public interest that focuses on poor and working people. That's the bottom line, and that's what's so exciting about this day of action at Princeton. All right, so uh, with our remaining time, we want to open this up as a conversation. But to do that, what we thought we'd do is ask you to uh, begin to build some relationships with one another. So I want to ask that you find someone that you do not know in this room, or at least you don't know well. Uh, and just, we're going to take five minutes. And I want you to reflect on what was a moment uh, in relatively recent history uh, in which you were either angry or concerned. All right, so however you define that, try to be as specific as possible about that moment. And then think for a little bit uh, with your remaining minute or two around what questions you have for each other and for the folks up here. All right, so we're just going to take five minutes. Go for it.
All right, you got, you got two more minutes. So if one person's been doing all the talking, get the other person talking. All right, we're gonna pull it back together. So, great. So hopefully those can be the beginning of conversations that continue. Uh, so we wanna open it up for a, for a conversation. Uh, and I think, you know, to frame that conversation in the most sort of general way possible. Uh, I mean, the question that's on my mind is what do we do now? Uh, and that's the question that's been on my mind for the last three months. Um, and so we're not gonna resolve that question in the next 20 minutes, um, but hopefully we can surface uh, some ideas that help us uh, in answering that question in the coming, in the coming weeks, months, and, and years. So with that, um, just open it up for, for questions. I just had a little thing here. Uh, so my name is Sebastian Allen. I'm, you know, started this day with a group of graduate students. I am so beyond impressed by this. Uh, so I can't thank you so much for coming here. And this is this is not the end. And after this, we'll have a big tunnel meeting. So please, you know, join with us and keep answering those questions. And no, please, anyone. <laughs> Maybe just introduce yourself too when you ask a question. Great. Thanks so much for what you shared. My name is Elizabeth. I'm a graduate student also in the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, I previously worked uh, mostly with small business owners in Detroit and Flint, Michigan before coming to school here, and then was recently working in federal government for the first time. Um, and I, it was just this amazing shift of going from really grassroots work to large institutional work. And it's left me with a lot of questions in terms of your you know, question and prompt, what do we do now? I think there's this question I've been struggling with, which is when we organize and we think about sort of um, a new world order that in some ways might be emerging, do we, uh, do we try to build a new world order and new institutions and new modes of being alongside our existing societal power brokers? Or do we try to sort of infuse our existing large institutions with new ways of thinking and new ways of being. So these large banks, these large governments, these structures don't feel like they're going anywhere. And so dismantling them is one strategy, and I feel like that's sort of been the predominant way of thinking about organizing. But I just spent time in the federal government, and I can tell you, working with Obama senior advisors, that there are ways to influence the conversations. There are ways to change opinions. And I think we need to, it's, I guess I'm just, really thinking about how to bring that organizing spirit to the large banks or to the large institutions, or if that's not the right use of time, effort, and energy, if we're building a new, you know, new institutions alongside. I hope that makes a little bit of sense, but I would just really welcome others' thoughts and, um, and how you're grappling with those questions. Um, I don't think anybody knows, so I'm gonna say something. Uh, just because I've also thought about this, um, and I'll just be brief in case other people have reflections. 
I'm currently in policy school. I mean, we're in the same program. <laughs> so um, I, I feel like one of the reflections that I've had on this question is that there needs to be both, like both and, that there needs to be both people inside of structures that are thinking in new ways and uh, trying to do, you know, reform from within. But what I've seen, well, and I guess I'll take an international example as, as something that was a uh, learning opportunity for me. When I was in South Africa for six weeks this past summer, I was doing a bunch of interviews with folks that had been really active in the anti-apartheid movement, um, and it's now 20 years afterwards. And one of the things that was striking to me was the reflection of how the liberating party, the ANC, um, had gained power and was at that forefront of like being radical and being, you know, the, the change uh, party. And then 20 years later, they still maintain the same kind of loyalty from the base as they did when they were the radical revolutionary party. And what that does then is it sort of neuters any sense of accountability um, and, it, and it makes folks feel more like I have to pledge allegiance to this group rather than you're accountable to me. And so I guess when I think about sort of how do you change those internal structures, yes, I think getting bankers to be more ethical and getting folks in government to, to have more of sort of a respect for grassroots is important, but I just think it's sort of, sort of the nature of power relations that it needs to be held accountable. That's all I would offer. I'll just add that I think sometimes it's a question of uh, tactic versus goal. So if you're thinking about something like institutional reform and alternative institutions, for example, some people are in institutional reform like spaces in order to take those resources in order to build alternative institutions. So institutional reform becomes a sort of tactic towards a goal of an alternative institution. This is to sort of corroborate some of what you're saying, that they don't always have to be pitted against each other, but can actually be collaborative and symbiotic. Um, this isn't really a question uh, as it, so much as it is a uh, response to the point. Uh, it was Elizabeth? El Elizabeth raised. So I'm, I'm David Walsh. I'm a um, uh, graduate student in the history department. I'm also a labor activist on this campus. Um, but I, I'm not actually going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about something I heard that was really interesting when I was down in Philly a couple of, uh, couple of months ago now. Um, is anybody here from Philadelphia involved in the Socialist Party in Philly? <laughs> no, I know. I'm like not, that's the same question, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to like out anybody. This isn't like you know, this isn't neo McCarthyism or whatever the hell that is. Just no, slip, slip that second one in there. Yeah, no, no, no. The, the reason, the reason I ask that is because I'm just telling a story about something I heard in a meeting down there, and if somebody's actually involved, then I wanted to like defer to them because this is actually their story. Um, but basically, it, it was a meeting. It was, it was this question: What do we do next? And what they proposed down in Philly, the Socialist Party, was, well, you know what? Let's organize locally and let's try to change the composition of city government in Philadelphia. Now, my understanding is they're a, um, they have an at-large uh, city council system, which means they have ward representatives, but they also have a handful of at-large seats that go to the party that gets the second most votes in, uh, amongst uh, uh, the parties in Philly. And that's the Republican Party. But the margins are pretty, like, they get like 150,000 Democratic votes and like 30 or 40,000 Republican votes. And so the, the Philly socialist strategy is, well, you know, we're not going to try party capture. We're not going to become Democrats. What we are going to do is we're going to try to supplant the Republican Party as the largest political party in Philadelphia. So we win an election, and suddenly you go from a city council that is mostly Democratic with a Republican minority to a city council that is mostly Democratic with a socialist minority. And that changes things pretty dramatically, at least at the local level. And that's how power gets built. So that's one strategy, one way to think about how to deal with this question of do we work within institutions or build our own institutions and that interaction with kind of local government. So that's all I had to say. Hi, I'm Tasha and I'm a junior in the economics department, so undergrad. Um, the question I had mainly had to deal with I guess developing empathy within groups, I've noticed that in my experience, so as a Christian, um, particularly a Jamaican Christian, there's been this lack of mentioning what's happening nationally. Um, this summer I was traveling and I was in Atlanta and I went to Ebenezer Baptist Church and for me, it was right after Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, which was very traumatic for me after just having left New Orleans. Um, 
but what really spoke to me in the midst of that service was how the minister actually mentioned that Philando Castile had been shot or that Alton Sterling had been shot. But within my own church back home, my Jamaican church, that hasn't been mentioned at all. That's not something that's said. And so that's one example, but how even within classism, like my friend and I always talk about classism within blackness, or I guess you would even say like within different races, how do you address that and how do you create a coming point in which you can have some sort of I guess consensus, because that's what I found to be the largest problem, even on this campus, and creating friendships. You know, there are differences among us, and that we can't seem to come together on. So, how would you answer that? Wow, that's, a, that's a very powerful question, my right dear sister. You know, there's a wonderful line, contra critique of pure reason, where he says, "Examples of a go kart of judgment." We have to be examples. It just strikes me, we are the kind of creatures that we are inspired by great, visionary, courageous, compassionate examples. Both of us are Christians. Palestinian Jew named, named Jesus means a lot. And we love Hillel too, but Jesus is special. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> example. Martin King, example. Hella Baker. How do we become examples in such a way that the best of what is inside of each and every one of us can become much more visible and tangible, and therefore it might become even contagious. That's how social moments, social momentum, and rarely but magnificently social movements, and social movements are the thermostats of a society. They're not the thermometers. Most of the politicians are thermometers. They just reflect. But the thermostats shape and reshape the climate, the atmosphere. That's what Occupy did. That's what the feminist movement, that's what the anti-homophobic movement did. That's what the abolitionists did. That's what the black freedom movement and so forth, so Chicano movement. How do we become examples? Now, unfortunately, most of our churches have become a, a tied to modes of accommodation to structures of domination, patriarchal forms, homophobic forms. But that doesn't mean they don't have prophetic potential. The same would be true of synagogues, same is true of temples, and so forth and so on. We live in a highly commodified society, so you end up with commodified chamber of commerce religion. That goes hand in hand with such a culture. But it doesn't exhaust all possibilities. So first, the, the personal question, how do we become better examples in context of struggle with solidarity with other folks, the Mexicans, the Muslims, and so forth and so on, at this particular, particular moment? Appreciate that question. So the examples include not just exemplary individuals, but exemplary organizations and exemplary coalitions of institutions and organizations that have been capable and proven their capability by success of achieving significant social change. So when Cornell mentions the abolitionists and the feminists, and so, we need to look at how large-scale social change has been accomplished in the past. And it is remarkable the extent to which the patterns keep showing up again and again. And they do involve making extensive use of existing institutions and organizations. If, if, if you look closely at the civil rights movement and you look at what was required to bring about the breakthroughs that started to happen around the mid-1950s, it's 40 years of building up institutions that were capable of coalescing into something, into a movement they didn't even imagine in the first place. Now that might sound like a council of despair because we are right now in an emergency situation. And we have to realize that what Bannon Trump intend for us by all manifest evidence is the destruction of every check on executive power that exists within our governmental situation. On the, they even pointed toward the models that they are using. So look at Hungary, look at the use of 
the proposal for building a wall. It goes down to that level of detail. The objective of the, of the, the current administration is to destroy, if possible, every possible check on executive power. That means congressional opposition, that means judiciary, the judiciary as a <coughs> broadly accepted authority within society, it means the universities, and it means the press. It is not accidental that Trump uh, referred to the press as the enemy of the people. That is, I, I was just waiting for when that, uh, when that would come up. Now what this means is, when I say that we are in a, we're in an emergency situation, is that all the other forms of social ill that we are concerned to fight are themselves in, uh, uh, that, that the struggle against those particular forms of domination, exploitation, poverty, other forms of social ill. The efforts on those fronts are endangered by a radical shift in the constitutional protections that created the space within which the great democratic social movements of the modern era uh, flourished. So right now, part of what we have to do is to gather our institutional organal, organizational strength to the extent we can. And that means everybody in this room and everybody you can persuade if you are just a free-floating individual in this moment and you are not finding ways to affiliate so that you can be part of an institution whose power can be made available to the fighting of, the, mm. uh, of, the, uh, of these ills under these emergency situations, then you are just being a, a stereotypical idealist whose idealism is a way of, is actually a way of contributing to the situation by taking pride in your um, hatred of the present. If that's all you can do, you are as guilty of a complicity in the situation as the person who doesn't care at all, let alone the person who's actually trying to foment the difficulty. So, you're part of a church. That's a starting point. That means you know, a, a principal point of action for you is to be more of a member of that church than you have been before and to see how, the, how much that, that group can be, can be um, persuaded to come with you on a journey that might seriously address the social ills of this moment. If we can get to the point where uh, we can be beyond this moment of emergency, uh, we can then continue the process, the, the decades long process of building up broader cultural resources for making uh, larger scale changes happen. But I think we're in a unique moment at the, just now. I think we have time probably for one last question. Um, why don't we go over here? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Fatima Mughal, and I'm actually here with uh, an organization called Stand Central Jersey, and we're just a new grassroots organization, and um, been, we actually came together two days after the election, mm -hmm. so very new. Um, but what's been great is we've been getting a good amount of people following us, and we've been started with a Facebook group and got a website. Um, our leadership is actually pretty diverse, uh, which is great, but our issue, one of our big struggles has been, um, like I said, our uh, community has kind of grown. We've got, how many people were these? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so we have about 1,600 people on our Facebook group. So we really have a great uh, group of people online, but one of our big struggles, I said our leadership is very diverse, but one of our struggles is getting a diverse uh, following, coming to our meetings and um, just really Part of, we want to be part, more part of the community and making sure that the, the people who are a part of the organization are really representative of the people who are 
being uh, attacked right now or the people who are being victimized. We want to make sure we have we give them a voice that we're not speaking for them. Um, so do you have any sort of advice for us for what's the best way to kind of get more of a diverse following? Or so uh, it, 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 can everybody in the group please take this seriously? She's talking about Stand Central New Jersey. If Stand Central New Jersey does not grow by 200 members by tomorrow, I would be very disappointed. Okay. In terms of answering your question, the next task is to use that Facebook page to gather small group meetings for people who are in various locations within the, uh, within the central Jersey counties. So then we, then we need to begin the process. So we, we need to look seriously at, at what it looks like to have concerns emerge from below and congeal into issues. I talk about that process in some detail in Blessed Are the Organized. It's a, it's a process that people who are starting new groups and want to do something and want leaders to be accountable to the rank and file need to understand. Otherwise, it will, what you create are groups where there are spokespersons who are, are not really speaking for anybody. And everybody in the power structure sniffs that out immediately when there are people who are just free-floating spoke, spokespersons and they can't turn out members to a meeting, they, they, they can't reveal the extent to which they've done the work of one-on-one -on -one meetings, then small group meetings, then research groups, then accountability sessions for politicians. Then, you know, the next point is it is extremely important for this kind of organizational activity to go on outside of the political parties. If we think that the only way that we really participate is by finding the right candidate and then pouring energy into those activities, Bernie's campaign, the Obama efforts, and so on, all of that effort is lost at the end of the campaign. And it does not create an organization that can hold the relevant officials accountable. All of that energy has gone down the drain repeatedly. This is what must not happen now. We have to build up some lasting organizations that have power and accountability. So just really briefly to make that even more concrete, because I think this is a crucial question. One thing to recognize is that your group isn't going to become the group that you want it to be through Facebook. So there is no substitute in organizing for conversation between human beings in the same room, one-on-ones and house meetings. That is the building block of all organizing. So for 10 years prior to becoming the ED of SCLC and then founding with others SNCC, Ella Baker was on the road building chapters of the uh, NAACP throughout the South. Right? Her question when she would meet people is, where you hail from? Because she always knew somebody where they hailed from that she could have a conversation with them about. Right? That, that is what builds movements. But I think, and it's also what builds trust to get to the question that, and the space for disagreement, and the space for solidarity across difference of class and privilege and race. Right? But I think the other thing that's important to note is it's not about building consensus, which I think is a word that came up. Right? We're not gonna have, I mean, to talk about just briefly, community that I'm really involved in, in the Jewish community, I was part of a group that built that put together this organization called If Not Now, trying to, be a, trying to found an anti-occupation movement within the Jewish world, we're never gonna have consensus around opposing the occupation in, the, in, you know, in synagogues across the country. The question is, how does that become an issue that people have to take a stand on? And that is, the, you know, in a, the, the, the hard question is, how do you move into that from the trust, from the relationships? But consensus is not what we're trying to build, right? If you look closer to, you know, to take an issue here, you know, maybe closer to home at Princeton, right? So let's say, you know, um, there are, we know that there are contracts at Princeton um, for the Pentagon, you know, various research, right, for, for, for making Trump's army stronger. We're not going to have consensus around whether this university should be in that business. But we might be able to make that 
an issue that people have to take a stand on. Right? So the art of organizing is building the relationships and the trust to create the solidarity to then turn issues into something that people have to take a stand on. And I think that's the big challenge that we have moving forward, the kind of patient work of building long-standing relationships that Jeff and others were talking about, and then moving that into actions that really force people to take a stand on the crises that we're facing in our politics at the moment. So, yeah. Just really quickly, um, this is all great. Also, food and fun. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> people don't want to be in your organizing meeting on a hungry stomach. If you've ever been to a church and you're hungry, it's like the worst experience of your life. Um, it's the same thing in class, it's the same thing in organizing meetings. So if you're gonna have food there, let people know that their food will be there and a lot of people will come. Um, and the other thing is have fun with it. The last thing that people want and organize, I know I don't want, is we're always just talking about oppression, oppression, oppression. Our stories are not just, our stories, our lives are not just in response to the injustices that we face. So, I mean, have parties, have music, have culture, have arts, have something where people can come and build beloved community that's not simply reducible or in response to their injustice, but that allows them to display their full humanity, their full humanity. Exactly right. I know it's getting late, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. Yeah. Professor West with the last word. I've got, a, I've got an anthem for your magnificent organization. There's a genius from Vallejo named Sly Stone, he wrote a song called Stan. You put that on your Facebook. <laughs> put that on your Facebook and say we for high quality and deep integrity and the diversity will follow to the degree which we have high quality and deep integrity. Stay strong here in Jersey. <laughs> everyone who's been in the room to say that it's been an honor really and a privilege to learn with you. I want to thank all five of our panelists and every one of you who came to the room who joined in conversation and contributed to this discussion. There is food outside, I believe, on dinner, and then there's a, um, there's a community meeting back in this room, a town hall at 7 o'clock. Yes. And we also have a teaching rhino uh, led by the Dream Team and Latinx and Lalit. Okay, so stay with us. Grab a slice of pizza from this door and then